Not just anyone can become the leader of a crime family. You have to work your way up from the very bottom, know the right people, and survive. If you prove yourself to be reliable, trustworthy, and never rat on your peers, you might just find yourself at the top. That was certainly the case with Chicago-based gangster Frank Nitti, the successor to the infamous Al Capone, and the man that led the Chicago outfit to branch out and diversify their dealings in order to bring in even more money than before. One thing that Nitti brought to the job was he was not as high profile of an individual. The second thing that he did was he really worked to diversify the outfit's crime portfolio. And before, they were pretty much focused on vice, liquor, gambling, and prostitution. Nitty got involved, got the outfit involved in extortion, labor racketeering, dog racing tracks. Despite his acquired infamy, people referred to him by the wrong name throughout his entire career. People know this famous sort of infamous mobster as Frank Nitty, but in fact, his name was Frank Nitto and everybody who knew him called him Frank Nitto. But for whatever reason, once he started reaching the pages of the newspapers in the late 20s, early 30s, reporters made the mistake of spelling his name Nitty with an I. And this caught on, and so all the newspapers started calling him Nitty <laughs> to the point where even other mobsters, you know, sort of just played along and decided to call him Nitty as well. But Nitty wasn't quite as popular with government officials. Lang was paid by the mayor $15,000 to execute Frank Nitty. I mean, this is how corrupt politics and, and policing were in Chicago at the time, that the mayor would somehow sanction an assassination in order to advance his cause of fighting crime in Chicago. This is Mafia. Frank the Enforcer Nitti was born Frank Ralph Nitto in 1886 to a family in Angri in the Campania region of Italy. Jeff Schumacher is the vice president of exhibits and programs at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. It was somewhat impoverished, like a lot of Italy was at that time, so there was a lot of discussion about emigrating to the United States. There were plans to move in that direction, except that Luigi, his father, died uh, in 1888 when Frank Nitto was just two years old. Nonetheless, the, his widowed mother and Frank and his sister ended up emigrating to the United States in 1893. Nitto was maybe six years old at the time. And they settled in Brooklyn, which it, you know, there were really two choices for Italians who moved to New York at that time. One was the slums of Little Italy in Manhattan. And then there were some neighborhoods in Brooklyn where you could also settle. And they chose Brooklyn, which was probably a smart choice. It was a little bit nicer, a little less problematic for a young kid. After moving to the nicer of the two locations, Nitti attended school, but not for long. Nitti was the first in his family to read and write English, but he dropped out of school after the seventh grade, really because he had to work full time for his family. His, mo his mother, again, was widowed, he had a younger sister. And, and so it was, it was difficult. And so he needed to help with the income for the family. This is where Nitty met future fellow gangster, Al Capone. The first thing to, to know is that there is no familial relation between Frank Nitty and Al Capone. Uh, they were not cousins, as many people had claimed over the years. However, as young children, they lived in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. They lived close to each other. And Nitty knew Al Capone's older brothers pretty well. They all were sort of part of this Navy Street Boys gang. And uh, they were pretty young, but they were involved in different kinds of mischief together. And then Al was considerably younger at that time. Just a, it was almost like a mascot for the group. He was a little kid. So he would tag along with his older brothers once in a while. So they bonded in this sense. They knew each other from the old neighborhood. So later on, this became important because it, it's how Frank Nitti ended up coming back into the fold with Al Capone in Chicago. But there's, there's no evidence of any actual blood relationship between them. As he got a little bit older, Nitti ended up leaving Brooklyn around 1910. It's, it's not exactly clear why he left or where he went. After leaving Brooklyn, 
It's pretty up in the air where he went to next. <laughs> uh, it's one of those mysteries of his life where for a number of years, uh, he seemed to be MIA. We didn't really know where he was. It does appear that he likely moved to Chicago in 1913. There's some evidence that uh, that was his uh, resting point. But even after that, we know he was in, up in Dallas, Texas, as late as 1917 because he got married there. And he married a, a, a Russian Jewish woman who may have been from Chicago, but they ended up getting married in Dallas. And then they moved to Chicago the following year. So, you know, his early life is, is not terribly eventful from an organized crime standpoint. He's just trying to make ends meet. Now in Chicago, Nitty starts getting into organized crime through an acquaintance who just so happened to be working on something big. He was creating the first Chicago-based crime family. The Chicago outfit really starts with a man named Big Jim Colosimo. Colosimo really was, uh, uh, ran all the prostitution and other rackets in Chicago in the early 1900s. And Colosimo's empire really grew after he brought in a man named Johnny Torrio from New York as his number two man. Now, incidentally, Torrio lived in the same neighborhood as Frank Nitti when he was a kid. And he was a, a racketeer there in Brooklyn. So when Torrio came in, he was like a criminal mastermind. He really understood how to navigate the underworld. And so he helped Colosimo grow his, uh, grow his empire. Colosimo and Torrio were starting something that would go on to become the infamous Chicago outfit we all know today. But first, Torrio had to take control to ensure that his vision was exactly what he pictured. And they also got involved in something that ended up being the most lucrative thing in the history of the mob, and that was bootlegging during Prohibition. But Colosimo was kind of a, uh, a narrow-minded guy. He did not have the, the grand vision that Torrio had. He didn't want to you know, extend too far in the criminal rackets. So this was irritating to Torrio. Torrio ultimately has Colosimo killed in 1919. And, and Colosimo was killed right in his own restaurant called Colosimo's. So Torrio takes over. And not too long after that, he recruits a, a young man named Al Capone from New York, uh, from Brooklyn, to help him out in Chicago. And, and Capone quickly rises to the ranks of Torrio's organization. With Colosimo out of the way and Capone helping Torrio with his mission, things were finally underway. Now, Torrio has always been regarded as sort of a, a genius in, in the world of organized crime. And one of the reasons people cite for that is in 1923, he sort of orchestrated this mutual business understanding, this sort of truce among the rival bootleggers in the Chicago area. And what they did is they divided up the territory and decided, you know, everybody's going to make money. Let's just not fight over this territory. Let's all have a, a lucrative space and, and we'll all make money. But it always hurt profits whenever you start shooting, right? So this was his argument. This worked well for a while, but ultimately violence erupted again on the streets of Chicago, which in the 1920s was just kind of a bloodbath with these different rival bootleggers killing each other. So, it, and it ended up coming uh, home to roost for Torrio in 1925 when he was shot in the street. He survived, it was, a, it was amazing that he survived, but he did survive and he had decided to leave Chicago. And he put Al Capone in charge of what was coming to be known as Chicago Outfit. Now it was Capone's time to shine. He had control of the outfit to do with it whatever he saw fit. And uh, it was Capone who had a little bit different philosophy than, than Torrio, but he ended up growing the crime group's liquor and gambling operations. So Capone continued the rise of the Chicago Outfit. And, and one of the things that Capone did uh, very wisely was he surrounded himself with a lot of really solid, trusted lieutenants, you know, people who would, he could trust to do the kind of work that he needed to have done. So he brought in two of his brothers, Ralph and Frank Capone, and then he, he brought in his cousins, uh, the Fischetti brothers, and others who, uh, who really were, were good at being criminals and that were very trustworthy. So 1923, the same year, that Torrio was organizing the truce, Capone brought Frank Nitti, his childhood friend, into the outfit. And Nitti instantly had a prominent position because he was good with money. He understood how to manage money. He was kind of like the mob's accountant, if you will. 
and he was good at his job. One of his primary duties was he was a collector. People owed debts, and it was Frank Nitti's job to, to recover that money. And he was very frank and to the point uh, with these folks. He never went into length, long conversations. You know, if people didn't pay, they got one warning. And then if they didn't pay, he sent a collection squad to address the situation. So he didn't mess around. And I think it's much more about that than it is about him being a violent person himself. Nitty was uh, a very business-like person. He was a very no-nonsense businessman within the crime world. And, you know, there's no question that he plotted out and managed other people who, who hurt people or killed people, but he didn't generally do that himself. But the enforcer nickname came from the newspapers, as would, would tend to happen. And it really had to do with just making sure people paid their debts, paid what was owed to the Chicago outfit. Nitty was given an important spot in the group from the beginning. Very few were trusted more than him when it came to money. The only person really who ranked higher on the money side than Nitty at this time was Jake Guzik. And uh, Jake Guzik was very important to the Chicago outfit in these years because he was the man who uh, made sure people got the money they deserved. So uh, Nitty starts rising through the ranks pretty early on. And then when Capone takes over in 25, Nitty takes on an even more prominent role. One of the things about Nitty that's interesting is even though we think of him primarily as someone who organized the money, he was also became a really brilliant organizer of assassinations. The situation started heating up when other bootleggers started cutting in on the Chicago outfit's earnings. There was all these rival bootleggers that the Capone group was dealing with in Chicago. And one of them was particularly uh, problematic was the Northside gang which was ostensibly an Irish gang, although it was really a mix of people. And in 1926, Capone decides it's time to eliminate uh, a rival gangster named Jaime Weiss. This was not going to be easy because Weiss was a formidable character in Chicago. Well, Capone puts Nitty in charge of this operation. Nitty came up with the idea for what later became known as the second floor ambush technique for killing someone. Weiss lived in the second floor rooms over a flower shop. And so what Nitty did was he rented second floor rooms that looked out on the flower shop from around the surrounding neighborhood. And so the idea was to have men stationed in these apartments on different rooms and waiting for the perfect opportunity to take down Jaime Weiss. So on October 11th, 1926, Weiss exits a car on the first floor in front of the flower shop. And when he comes into range, gunfire erupts from two different directions and Weiss is killed. So Nitty was the, uh, was the mastermind behind this murder and it, he became known sort of for uh, how, how smart he was about you know, killing people. It's not something to be proud of really, but it's, in, in his world, you know, it was a considerable thing. And uh, Nitty actually later used these similar tactics, it is believed, to take out a man named Joe Aiello. So this became sort of a technique that he perfected and that others picked up on later. And this is how the group operated for some time before the indictments would come down on them. This summer, I'm really looking forward to things starting to get back to normal. Seeing friends I haven't seen in well over a year, going to family barbecues again, being outside and enjoying the sun on my face, it's a feeling I really love. It looks like this summer will be almost... normal. Which, it turns out, is super refreshing. If you want your brain to feel like it's summertime all the time, download Best Fiends. When I play the game, it makes my brain feel like I just went snorkeling or jumped into a cold pool after being out in the heat all day. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is, this game is a fun and refreshing experience for your brain. Solving puzzles, collecting new characters, unlocking new levels, it feels good. And once you start, you just don't want to stop. With thousands of fun puzzles to solve, there's something new every day. I'm now playing level 96, 
and there is no stopping me. I'm on a roll, and there are plenty more levels to go. Best Fiends is way more fun than the other matching puzzle games out there. It's one of those games that makes 30 minutes feel like 30 seconds, and it's totally free to download. With Best Fiends, the adorable, collectible characters just keep coming. And the game releases new challenges, characters, and themes all the time. So you'll never run out of fun missions and things to do. But in my opinion, the best part of this game is the strategy element. I can use the special abilities of the different characters that I've collected to advance past levels and in turn, level up my characters more. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? Lately, I've been feeling pretty stressed and overwhelmed. This stress can manifest itself in my work, in my personal life, and this is the kind of thing that can be hard to deal with on my own. If you've been feeling similarly, you should check out BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you don't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Not to mention, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. That's Better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Mafia listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. It's 1930, and the intelligence unit of the U.S. Treasury Department finally has enough information to go after some high-profile names of the Chicago outfit. Jeff Schumacher is the vice president of exhibits and programs at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. Al Capone went to prison for tax evasion, and so did Frank Nitti, actually. Uh, the uh, Treasury Department of, you know, the U.S. Treasury Department had a unit called the Intelligence Unit, and it was led by a man named Elmer Irie. And Elmer Irie was basically told uh, by his superiors, by which I mean like the President of the United States, we need to crack down on organized crime in Chicago, and specifically go after Al Capone. One of the ways they figured out how to do this was to not only go after Capone, but go after other individuals who were in the top echelon of the Chicago outfit. So one of those people was, was Frank Nitti, he ended up having charges filed against him in March of 1930. He ended up being convicted and sentenced to 18 months in prison, in which he served most of those, like 16 months. So when he came out, you know, Al Capone uh, was in. He had been convicted of tax evasion. He was in prison. So Nitty basically takes over the Chicago outfit at that point. He was said to be Capone's personal choice for the job. You know, considering Nitty's skills, his business acumen, and his, his experience, and, and of course Capone's long relationship with him, Capone thought he was the right guy for the job. Not everybody agreed <laughs> within the Chicago outfit, and that's another issue, but at the time, Nitty took charge, and the way he operated was, was quite a bit different from the way Al Capone ran things. Now with Nitty in charge, 
things were about to change. Al Capone was very outward in his presentation to the community, right? He held press conferences and he had meetings with public officials and he opened a soup kitchen to help people during the depression. So here was a guy who was in the news all the time and he kind of relished the whole thing. But it ultimately hurt him because here he was, you know, with a tax evasion charge and then a very public trial and then a conviction that ended up sending him to prison for 11 years for not paying his taxes. That's a pretty long sentence. Somebody was setting an example, right? And one of the reasons they wanted to set an example is because Capone was just one of the most famous people in America. Well, the way Nitty saw it and, and the way other members of the Chicago Outfit leadership saw it is they needed to keep a low profile. They needed to not be in the newspapers every day and they needed to operate their criminal operations, you know, in secrecy. This is just one of the reasons some thought Nitty was perfect for the job. The one thing that Nitty brought to the job was he was not as high profile of an individual. The second thing that he did was he really worked to diversify the outfit's crime portfolio. And before they were pretty much focused on vice, by which I mean liquor, gambling, and prostitution. And while those things continued, you know, liquor kind of fell off the, off the map because prohibition ended in 1933 and he was needed to look for other ways to make money. So Nitty got involved, got the outfit involved in extortion, uh, labor racketeering. Uh, they had dog racing tracks. That was a big, big thing. They made quite a bit of money on dog racing. And then the race wire, which was the providing of, of results of horse races uh, to, for betters. And uh, the mob had a long history of being involved with the race wire until it really became uh, unnecessary for those kinds of operations to exist as technology advanced. But Nitty didn't just offer a new sense of privacy for the group. He also brought about a new hierarchy and way of running everything. And the third element, I think, of Nitty's reign that was important is you know, when Al Capone was in charge, he was in charge. He was the boss. There was no question. You didn't question what he did or said. I mean, he was the man. And in the Nitty environment, he was, it was more like a board of directors. Nitty may have been the chairman of the board, but there were other very important people on that board. And they had more discussions about what to do than just somebody, you know, passing down edicts uh, as Capone had done. And, and so it was much more like a corporation with other people having input into what happened. Some people actually believe that Nitty was more of a front man for the outfit and that the real folks in charge were not him at all, that there was other members of this, you know, the supposed board of directors. I think what is important is that they kept such a low profile. We don't really know for sure who was in charge and they wanted it that way. They liked that murkiness that certainly helped them and kept them out, you know, kept people guessing about what exactly the outfit was doing. And guess they did. While the public didn't know of all the new changes that were taking place within the organization, people still knew Nitty was calling the shots. A mayor was elected named Anton Cermak. He wanted to crack down on crime in Chicago. And, and one of the ways he sought to do that was to, to take Frank Nitty and the Chicago outfit out of the picture. So in December of 1932, there was a police raid on Nitty's office. This was led by uh, two detectives named Harry Lang and Harry Miller. And Lang and Miller were actually reporting directly to the mayor at that time. Well, there's an interesting dispute you know, over what happened in that office. What, what essentially happened is Nitty was shot three times. He was shot in the back and he was shot in the neck by Detective Lang. But Lang also was shot in the hand. What actually happened is Lang shot himself to make it look like a self-defense, like Nitty had taken the first shot and he had to respond to that. But the reasons behind the police raid were dark and it was clear the mayor had his own personal agenda in mind. What really happened <laughs> is Lang was paid by the mayor $15,000 to execute Frank Nitti. I mean, this is how corrupt politics and, and policing were in Chicago at the time, that the mayor would somehow sanction an assassination 
in order to advance his cause of fighting crime in Chicago. The reason this came out, initially came out, that exactly the detective's story had was the story in the newspapers the next day that, you know, it was a self-defense and that Nitty pulled a gun and so forth. But there was an officer at the scene who ultimately testified that that's not what happened, that in fact, this was all a, like a frame up of Nitty. And they, they, they also testified that Nitty was not armed at all. Moore was coming out about the setup and soon Miller felt he had to fess up to the payments too. It, it really showed that Lang was a bad guy. This case that where these revelations came out happened after the police department had basically given a bonus to Miller and Lang for their great works and called it was, you know, gave him an award for meritorious service. <laughs> well, in the meantime, you know, Nitty is in the hospital. He's in very serious condition at first, but he spent several months in the hospital recovering. And, you know, he was the first person who said, hey, that's not what happened. And that's not what happened at all. And then later, Miller, the other detective, he testified in court that Cermak had paid his partner to do this. Some see this as Mayor Cermak doing what he had to do to keep his community safe. Others see it as an unnecessary and violent step taken to get what he wanted. There's two ways of thinking about Cermak. On the one hand, you know, he had this public campaign to fight crime in Chicago, so he may have just wanted to eliminate Nitty. The other theory is that Cermak was not such a clean individual in wanting to clean up the city so much as he wanted to control the criminals that were in the city. So he was not able to control Nitty, so we want to get rid of him so that the other criminals he did support could run more freely. Either way, you know, it was obviously a, a, a horrible thing to do. So somehow Nitty is, is accused of attempted murder. He has to go to trial and be acquitted. But these detectives are accused of simple assault, quote unquote and paid $100 fines for trying to kill Nitty. Nonetheless, they're off the force. So technically, justice was served in this way, but it was also served in another way later on. Just two months after the hit on Nitty, Mayor Cermak was killed. He happened to be standing next to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt at a public event, and a, a person fired shots and they, they ended up killing Cermak. Now, at the time, there was a lot of speculation that somehow the mob was involved in killing Cermak, but it appears that the shooter, who was like an anarchist, uh, was trying to kill the president. He was trying to kill Roosevelt, and he missed and hit Cermak. So that's most likely what happened. And, uh, but nonetheless, the Cermak was obviously out of the picture as well. This summer, get the most out of your travels abroad by learning the language of your destination with Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. From ordering in restaurants or asking for directions to gaining a deeper understanding of the culture, Babbel makes the whole process of learning a new language addictively fun and easy. With bite-sized lessons you can actually use in the real world, Babbel is a can't-miss travel essential. I know that listeners of Mafia have been getting updates on my experiences with French and how my progress is going using Babbel. And I have to say, I'm definitely getting better. Compared to where I was at last year, my whole comprehension of the language has gotten noticeably better. I can hear people speaking the language and understand some of it to put together what they're saying to me, which has been so cool. Babbel's 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Unlike the infamous language classes you took in high school, Babbel designs their courses with practical, real-world conversations in mind. Things you'll get to use in everyday life. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. 
In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code MAFIA. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code MAFIA, for an extra three months free. Not all of Nitty's schemes ended up being successful moves towards more money and power. In the 30s, he brought some of the organization into extorting the Hollywood film industry. Mob Museum VP of Exhibits and Programs, Jeff Schumacher, explains. The story of the Hollywood extortion scandal really starts in the early 1930s with two labor racketeers named Willie Byoff and George Brown. These guys were kind of low-level guys in Chicago, but they were extorting theater owners in Chicago for money. They were getting like thousands of dollars from these theater owners. And what the, the original premise was that they were going to take this money. They were like asking for donations basically for a soup kitchen. And so these, these theater operators gave them money. Well, Bayoff happened to mention this, this scam that he was running to one of the Chicago Outfit members, Nick Cercella. And Cercella liked it so well that he made Bayoff and Brown employees of the outfit. So with the outfit's help, the next step up the ladder was for George Brown, the, the other racketeer, to become president of a union, of a theater union, called the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Stagehands. This basically was the major movie industry union. With Brown in charge of the union, studio executives would have no choice but to go along with what he said, or he'd prevent them from getting any actors for their films. And, and so with this leverage, now this guy, this corrupt criminal is the head of the union, Bayoff and Brown start extorting money from the top Hollywood studios. And the premise is, give us, pay us money or else we're, you're gonna have union problems. You're gonna have trouble making movies because we're gonna have union members who are walking off the job, they're gonna slow walking their, their jobs, whatever the different techniques were. And, and so in order to keep union peace, labor peace, these uh, the movie studio executives agreed to pay. Well, this lasted for a while several years, but ultimately Bayoff and Brown were indicted in 1941 for this scheme and they were found guilty. Bayoff was sentenced to 10 years in prison and Brown was sentenced to eight years. Nick Cercella, incidentally, was also indicted, pleaded guilty and received eight years. This wouldn't have been a big deal to the outfit had it ended here, but Bayoff and Brown weren't about to go down alone. What happened is Bayoff and Brown decided to turn state's evidence, as they say, to become government witnesses against the Chicago outfit. And so in 1943, top members of the outfit were indicted in the Hollywood extortion deal. Frank Nitti, Paul Ricca, Johnny Rosselli, who was based in LA, Louis Campagna, Phil D'Andrea, Charlie Joy, Frank Diamond, Ralph Pierce. All these guys were major players in the Chicago outfit and they were all indicted in this case. The only one who got off ultimately was Ralph Pierce, whose charges were dropped against him. But the others all received 10-year sentences. Despite their sentences, no one ended up serving their full time. Interestingly, they only ended up serving about three and a half years. And this was a, a public scandal at the time because people were like, what the heck happened here? These guys should be serving much more than one third of their sentence. Uh, you know, they did something horrible. There was a congressional investigation and a lot of uh, uh, revelations came out that probably a lot of payoffs were extended in order to get these guys out of prison early. But what ended up happening even before they went to prison was members of the outfit uh, blamed Frank Nitti for this mess. They believed that Nitti was responsible for getting them involved with Willie Bioff. You know, Nitti trusted him. Everybody else was a little bit wary of the guy. And obviously it didn't, that didn't work out for Nitti. Out of the group, 57-year-old Nitti was the only one who was not tried in the case for his crimes. Lawmakers just didn't get the chance to bring him to trial. 
in the morning, he and his wife got up and they had breakfast together in Chicago. And then his wife went off to the church. And when she did that, Nitty guzzled like a, a, a bunch of liquor, got drunk, started wandering about in the neighborhood. He ends up on a railroad yard, uh, basically uh, walking across the railroad tracks. There are witnesses who saw him. And these witnesses were like worried that he was gonna get run over by a train. But what he ended up doing was crossing the tracks and. And then they couldn't see him for a second and they heard two shots, two gunshots. And they at first thought maybe Nitty was shooting at them. Then a third shot they heard and they realized that Nitty was committing suicide. Strangely enough, he shot himself three times in the head. They missed, one of the shots missed. It went through his hat and didn't hit him in the head. Another one didn't kill him. And then the third one, I believe, actually killed him. So Nitty was despondent over what had happened. It's clear from that he did not want to go back to prison. I mean, he had served some time in prison for his tax evasion and did not enjoy that, as you might expect. There's been some speculation that he was claustrophobic and that prison was just torture for him because he was so claustrophobic. I haven't been able to confirm that. There was a lot of dialogue that he had terminal cancer and that, hey, you know, I'm not gonna spend my last you know, years with cancer in prison. But in any case, whether that's true or not, Nitty died by his own hand in 1943. The rest of the guys ended up going to prison for a short period of time. Interestingly, Willie Byoff lived. He got out of prison after being a government witness. He changed his name and he, he really tried to try to reinvent himself. Ultimately, the mob caught up with him in 1955 when he was living in Phoenix and he got into his truck outside of his house and it blew up and uh, blew him to smithereens. And so Willie Byoff got his finally in you know, like 12 years after, after the Hollywood extortion trial. Though he abruptly took his own life, Nitty's legacy and influence over mob proceedings remained throughout the rest of the history of the Chicago outfit. If Nitty has a legacy in terms of the, the way things played out for the Chicago outfit, it was that he, he introduced a, a quieter and a more businesslike approach to the criminal enterprise. Rather than calling attention to himself, as Al Capone had done, Nitty kept a low profile. The other thing he did was he really built up a great leadership structure within the outfit that paved the way for subsequent bosses such as Paul Ricca and, and especially Tony Accardo to further expand the outfit's wealth and influence in Chicago into the 50s and 60s when it was arguably the most powerful mob in America. But it was really Nitty who was the sort of transitional man between Capone and this sort of more business-like philosophy that, that really enveloped the outfit later. This has been Mafia an Audioboom original series hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. This show is produced by Audioboom's Lauren Vogel, Blair Payton, Pam Burroughs, Karen Bevan, and Rachel Jacobs. Executive producers for Audioboom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Special thanks to Jeff Schumacher for providing expert insight for this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. Next time on Mafia, Raymond Patriaca, a mobster so infamous and well-respected, he was known to crime families and all across New England. People were more likely to turn to Raymond Patriaca or one of his members than they were to call the cops because they knew that, or they felt that anyway, they probably get a better result and a faster result by going to the mob boss than by going to law enforcement. But one concealed microphone by the FBI would reveal all of Patriarca's secrets and expose the mob for what it was. That microphone will end up being a treasure trove of, of mob activity and, and learning about the uh, New England mob.